Hello and welcome to Cinema Savvy. It is myself, George, and today I am presenting a very special interview uh, for you all as our coverage of London Film Festival continues. I've been able to get an interview with a director from the new documentary film, One Man and His Shoes. Um, this is the new documentary essentially on the Air Jordan shoes, how they came to be their sort of a rise to the top of the sneaker market. It's a really good documentary. If you haven't already seen it, me and Chris did a review on it yesterday evening. So do have a quick look at that on the channel. Um, and what I'm going to do, I'm going to play the trailer a couple of seconds from it before crossing into the interview. They had hoped to sell $3 million worth of shoes, and they sold $126 million in the first year. No one did for marketing what Nike and Michael did for marketing. Nobody. Everything he was doing correlated to those shoes. And we bought into that because what was the tagline they were selling us? Is it the shoes? You said, damn, man, I can't be Michael Jordan, but I can have this piece of what he represents. I'm delighted to be joined by Yemi Bamiro for an interview for his brand new documentary, One Man and His Shoes. Uh, Yemi, welcome to Cinema Savvy. Hi, George. Thanks for having me. Brilliant. I want to say, first off, congratulations on the documentary. I had a lot of fun watching this. Um, <laughs> I think a lot of people will, uh, especially oh, thank you. this year, which I will... Have to get to at some point because there is a Netflix show which I'm assuming you've been asked a million times over the last few months. <laughs> I have, yeah, I have, yeah. Um, first up, I wanted to ask the idea for the documentary. Um, yeah. So there's sort of two sides to it. There's the collector's point of view, uh, and yeah. you have the the rise of the Air Jordan, the marketing, the brand itself. Yeah. I kind of wondered watching this because it's so well done throughout. Did you have an idea for one of those and the other came in? So was it essentially about collectors and then you brought the branding in? Or was it more so about the brand and the collectors came with it? Pretty much spot on. It was kind of like collectors first. I wanted to make a, I wanted to make a film about Air Jordan collectors, but specifically Air Jordan collectors. Uh, I've, I'd seen films about sneaker culture, which kind of profiled collectors um, and, you know, their kind of like enthusiasm for a number of brands, but I'd never seen anything specifically that focused on Air Jordans. And then I realised that perhaps that wouldn't sustain a, a kind of like an 85 minute plus film. And then I started to think about the origin story of uh, Air Jordan. And I thought that's pretty interesting. I've never seen that before. So then I became hellbent and, and we, the production team, two producers, Will Thorne and Michael Marden, we became a little bit obsessed with, you know, making a film that was definitive, coherent and comprehensive in terms of the Air Jordan story. So we wanted to sort of like speak to the men and women that were responsible indirectly and directly for this phenomenon that we now have today. The fact that, you know, 35 years since the release of the first sneaker, we are still talking about this shoe and nothing has ever eclipsed it in terms of popularity, in terms of like financials. Um, and, and yeah, that's pretty much how it came. So it was like collectors first, but then perhaps there's something more interesting if we kind of like tell this origin story that's never been explored in this way before. Absolutely. And I think that was something that I really enjoyed about it because I don't think you can enter it as here's all the collectors and everyone be like, well, how did we reach this point? So I thought it was a really good way to, to bring that into it because you need the build up to see how mm. and why it ended up being the way it did. And another thing mm. I wanted to add with this was mm. document yourself. Was it an entry point for yourself into sort of sneaker culture? Because certainly what surprised me the most in doing my research is that I would naturally assume that you'd be American because sneaker culture is big here in England, but yeah. it's not the level it is in the States and especially some of the locations you went to. So is it yeah. something you've always been familiar with prior to the documentary or? Yeah, it is. I've kind of like had a fascination with America as itself, like American culture, politics, society. I've had a fascination with that country since I was, you know, 13 or 14 years old. And I think that in terms of like an entry point, it was just fandom. You know, I, I would never call myself a sneakerhead. I've always liked trainers and appreciated trainers in terms of styles and stuff. But I do, you know, I think that I remember being a teenager in, you know, the 90s and just knowing that, you know, Chicago Bulls were larger than life. And you know, there was this god of basketball that was Michael Jordan and he had this tremendous, phenomenal brand and he wore these sneakers and he won all these championships in these sneakers. So I, I was aware of it. I was just, I'd just never seen anything that had told a definitive story, um, 
in the way that we have tried to tell this story, you know, in terms of like talking about the time in which this all happened, its impact on pop culture, uh, its impact on on race, its impact on politics and society. You know, I'd, I'd never seen that before. So I think that's what I was interested in the most. And, and you know, we all kind of like pursued that quite passionately, uh, my, myself and the producers. Absolutely. I think one thing I wanted to mention was in the documentary as well, you mentioned race just there then. Mm. I thought it was quite powerful. As someone that I didn't grow up, I mean, I was born in the mid 90s, so very much the early noughties was me and I knew mm. some Space Jam, but it's when you start to mention that you had essentially black people doing white advertising, I thought it was very powerful to bring into the documentary mm. because yeah. then you start bringing up Eddie Murphy, Eddie Murphy, mm. Michael Jackson, Michael mm. Jordan, you start, and I start clicking saying, because I wasn't there in the 90s, I didn't understand how powerful they all were at the time. Yeah, I really yeah. think for people, for me, not even my generation, other be younger people than me, that also, yeah. Stuff like that. So, I thought it was a really good thing, and that kind of leads on to my next point, which was that I don't think this film just caters towards Jordan fans. I think it's both basketball fans and even people mm. that know of him, like myself, that yeah. have been maybe Space Jam or maybe not even that. Maybe the yeah, yeah, you know, the yeah. have been through through Last Dance and stuff. And was there a specific audience you had in mind when you approached the documentary? Because I feel that you cater to so many different types and especially with the opening the opening credits this sort of the time yeah. I thought that was a really smart way to be able to bring in different people that don't know yeah and I thought it was really powerful that's something I was really impressed by oh that's really kind of you I think in terms of audience um it was it's weird that you say that because all we ever try to do is just cater to our own taste as filmmakers, you know, that, so that's myself and, the, and, and, and Will and Michael, we, we are all of the same age. We're sort of like, uh, you know, mid thirties uh, to, to late thirties. And we remember the eighties and we sort of remember, you know, the nineties coming of age in that time. And we just wanted the documentary to feel authentic and to feel quite cool. And, and, and we were, we didn't want it to be a fanboy Jordan documentary do you know what I mean like so almost like Anorak in 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 sort of like how forensic it would go and and so other people would miss miss the points we didn't really want that we wanted it to be sort of like accessible but we didn't want it to dumb it down so we wanted to talk about basketball we wanted to talk about American culture we wanted to talk about politics and race and 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 all of those rich subjects that you know make America quite a fascinating polarizing place and you know, ultimately we just wanted to tell a good story. So we just felt that anybody that was perhaps interested in, you know, stories that, that perhaps they thought that they knew, um, then we felt that this could be a film for them because, you know, on the, you know, on the surface level, it's about, okay, it's about Air Jordans, it's about the phenom phenomenon of Air Jordans. But if you pull the layers back a little bit, it's about so much more. It's about America's, you know, love affair with consumerism. It's about race. It's about politics. It's about, you know, the eighties. It's about the nineties. It's about, uh, you know, the African-Americans like mass market breakthrough in terms of entertainment. You said like Michael Jordan, and, and Eddie Murphy and, and, you know, all of these entertainers that came of age in the late 80s and the early 90s. We kind of like wanted to find some way of telling a coherent story and encapsulating all of those elements, basically. Absolutely. I think you did a great job of that as well. And one Thank of the things I've got, I've got a couple more questions, but I'll go on some of the lighter ones before I get into the sort of the last. No last worries. Last That's fine. Um, I was blown away at some of the names you're able to get in this documentary for an independent... <laughs> independent British documentary on, yeah. on basketball, you know, his, his former agent, NBA commissioner. I, yeah. I that was great, you know, especially yeah. again, sorry to bring in last dance, but when they were no, on, okay. you wouldn't expect them to be able to do an independent documentary as well as, you know, a Netflix production. Mm -hmm. I just kind of wondered, I know you mentioned in the sort of the ending sort of titles that you couldn't get anyone from Nike or the Jordan brand in. Mm -hmm. Was there anyone in particular that you were maybe trying to get in that could couldn't do it or had to change their mind any other names in that sense for sort of um, yeah I, I guess you know what this what we really wanted from this film is to it for it to be definitive so when I say definitive I mean that I wanted to talk to the men and women that were around when this was all happening so the people that were in the rooms the people that sort of like were with MJ when his star was just like rising and and that wasn't a lot of people you know that was Rob Strasser who's no longer with us so we managed to sort of like 
talk to his widow, his ex-wife, Julie, uh, that's Sonny Vaccaro, that's Peter Moore. They're, you know, there were like a handful, David Falk, his agent, there were like a handful of people that were around, but there was, you know, there was Howard White, who was another sort of, uh, you know, he was another right-hand man of, of Michael Jordan's who was around at that time. And he still works uh, at uh, Brand Jordan. So I was interested in, in talking to, to him, um, obviously Spike Lee as well. But I think when I, when I think about it, you know, we're, we were in, we're an independent team. It's like three guys made this film and, you know, not everyone that you ask is always going to be in your your documentary. And you know, these you know, I'm, I'm we're talking about an Oscar winning, you know, esteemed like film director and you know someone that works at a multi billion pound company. Like they're not just gonna you know reply to an email from a random guy from South London. So you know, I don't have any hard feelings that we weren't able to make um we make those those interviews happen, but. You know, I, I, you know, those were the ones that I was interested in. And, but, you know, I don't lose any sleep that over the fact that we weren't able to get them because I think we did a good job in sort of like, you know, getting the people that we did in the end. And I, I think they were phenomenal to get them in. And as well as the people involved on Jordan's side, the collectors that come into it, one thing I mm. liked is that it wasn't just sort of American collectors. You went to Tokyo, you went to Paris. Yeah. You were able to get that worldwide. And I can imagine... How did that kind of come to be? Are these people you might have been familiar with online or via reputation or make contact with them? Because it just goes to show, again, with that branding, that it's not just this domestic, yeah. they're really big in America. It's no, yeah. no, no, this is a phenomenon worldwide. Yeah, yeah. And I thought that was a really nice touch to bring in as well. Yeah, yeah, obviously. Sorry, let me just get the sun out of my eyes. I hope you don't mind. Uh, here we go. Um... Favorite a bit more, sorry. Um, so yeah, in terms of the collectors, so the community online of Jordan collectors is insane, and I think it's it's quite easy to 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 access that um, if you if you just approach them with the same enthusiasm that they sort of collect their Jordans with. And I think that's a passion, that's a love, that's a sort of like an obsession. And I was interested in that, you know, I was, I was really interested in how these collectors, you know, obsessed over this one brand. So uh, the guy from Detroit, he's a massive collector online, Jumpman, his name's Mark. And he, uh, yeah, he has this basement in Detroit, which is part of his house. And he has over a thousand pairs of sneakers. And I interviewed him twice. The first time was, I want to say in 2014. And then I went back, like maybe the beginning of last year and he'd moved house because he wanted to get a bigger basement because in the time that I'd interviewed him, uh, that time that had uh, elapsed, he'd basically collected more trainers and he needed a bigger space to, uh, to store them. And I think going into his basement is like going back in time. It's like a museum. It's a shrine to everything Michael Jordan. It's not just sneakers, it's Wheaty boxes, it's Gatorade boxes. It's incredible, you know? So yeah, and and the the guy in Paris is a guy called Air Ruddy. He's, he's, he doesn't collect at the same level that he collects, that he used to collect, but I was interested in him because he only collects one model like one basically one one series and that's the air jordan one he doesn't collect other, any other jordans but he's got the biggest air jordan one collection in the world you know and i yeah i was interested in him and it, you know i think the fact that all of these people were from different places and from different uh you know territories in the world but they still had this insane enthusiasm and passion for this brand and connection to this brand was the thing that i wanted to you know, express the most and communicate the most in the film. And the, yeah, the, the young lady in, in Tokyo, Yui, yeah, she's incredible as well. She no longer collects in the way that she did, but again, she's, um, you know, I found her online and like I said, they, they all know one another. So it was quite easy to sort of, you know, get them on board uh, once I pitched them the project, basically. Definitely. I think one thing with this documentary, you bring up the creation, the marketing, the success of the Jordans, but I think what makes this stand out from anything else I've seen, certainly with, with sneaker collecting, 
Mm. Yeah, I watched Last Dance the first time, and as many people did, I ended up buying another couple of pairs after watching it because <laughs> it, it's it's the show is done in a way that okay, he is great, he's phenomenal, and that's it. And you just want to buy him because they're there every minute. I think yeah. what stood out with this is that you're not afraid to show that dark side of collecting. Um, mm. I've, my, the thing I've always got is autographs, which is um, yeah. an insane thing when I've seen people how they act in London, staying up till five in the morning, and it's crazy yeah. seeing these types of people. And I kind of wanted to bring in the fact that with was it intentional to hold off bringing up this dark side of the collecting until later on in the documentary because mm. it does start off like last dance very well yeah. like i love that they're great shoes they're phenomenal the brand the mm. and everything's on point yeah yeah and, and then it's this montage you get that cctv footage which mm. is stuck in my mind still of that guy mm. being um, attacked outside a, a shop and you just yeah. see pulling the shoe mm. and I, I think that last name is just stuck in my head for over a day mm. and i, I kind mm. of did you always want to hold off until revealing that side of the collecting or was it something you wanted to bring in from the beginning? I think we did, we did grapple with how the third act was going to end. You know, like I said, this was an independent film. So we would talk to people, people that were, you know, more accomplished than ourselves in terms of making feature length documentaries. We talked to broadcasters that perhaps we thought were interested and everyone had a different opinion. Some people were like, we'll put that at the, the beginning and like you know it needs to be a story about you know this woman and whose son you know but who whose son was you know unfortunately killed uh, over these sneakers but I think we always push back because the entry point to this film was never it was never that we always wanted to sort of celebrate the brand and sort of like tell this origin story but then also not be shy about the fact that uh, not be shy about the fact of talking about the, these things happening you know that was really important we just basically wanted to tell the legacy of the shoe and you know the third act is unfortunately you know an unfortunate legacy of the shoe's history so yeah I we we found peace I, I remember you know it was a couple of years ago and we said well let's just make it the third act let's just you know show the brand and show how it got to this point like almost like cause and effect, you know, this this happened in this way. And, you know, the third act is a byproduct of, you know, this phenomenon and everything that happened. So, yeah, I think a couple of years ago, we kind of like broke the back and, you know, we were kind of like happy with that. And we found peace with the fact that we were able to tell the story in, in, in that way, you know. Absolutely. And I'm going to try and kind of merge my last two questions into one. So that's fine. I'm not I'll sure try and keep it follow- shorter. That's right. I'm not sure if you followed Ray Fisher, um, one of the actors from Just League, over the last few months uh, with his mm. issue with Warner Brothers. And he's been campaigning with the phrase accountability over entertainment. And that mm. stuck with me quite a lot. And certainly watching this, when you mentioned the murder of, of Josh Woods, mm. before that, you've got the Sports Illustrated cover. And mm. that's back from the 90s. And here yeah. we are talking the case from 2016. Mm. And I can't help but feel that, of course, it's, it's not Nike or Jordan that are behind that, but Mm. with a product that has the hyper marketing that creates that demand. And mm. I kind of compare it over here to England. When I was at school, you know, mm. whenever a footballer who I adored would release mm. new shoes, it'd always be like Cesc Fabregas for me. And I was like, yeah, yeah. and I remember when we're at school and when we're learning in England for football boots, it's, you'd always be three pairs of boots. You'd get a 30 pound one, a yeah. 70 pound one and the legit 200 pound ones. And it yeah. kind of made me think about all them times at school when you ask your parents for new boots and stuff. And, in this documentary with Jordan, it's the, okay, they're limited edition and they're always going to be expensive. There was never a, an entry point, a midpoint. It's mm-hmm. always been full price go in. And mm-hmm. I kind of wondered with that is, do you believe things like the small things like that, where Nike themselves have other products, which have had the successful launches and have had demand that mm-hmm. been able to contain, I think with Jordan, it, it brings that nasty side to it where it's so limited. And when you mentioned as well, the sort of the, the sister. Yeah. Jocelyn gave, yeah. gave her, her new new shoes yeah yeah and it's like but I, I I couldn't wear them until a month after I came out that that was tragic for me to hear. And, yeah yeah um, yeah I wonder what your thoughts were of that is that how Nike have approached their other brands in a very different mindset to how they've done Jordans they've never wanted to change it to modernize it yeah I, I guess my answer to that question would be that you know the objective of any business is to make money and and I think Nike you know, they're a marketing company that sells shoes. 
So they do marketing really well. They do marketing as well as they sell the shoes, right? And you can't really have one without the other. So I think the limited editions, like the hype culture, that's all good for the bottom line, you know, because it drives up sort of like demand and, you know, they're there to sort of like cater for that. Um, so I guess that if you start jumping into discussions about that, you're kind of, essentially talking about the evils of capitalism <laughs> like and and it's it's such a bigger sort of um, discussion and subject matter so I don't think Nike are you know an anomaly I don't think you know there are other companies that 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 do this I I, I think it kind of I think it resonates with us because it's 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 shoes do you know what I mean it's like trainers and it, it feels like you know they're so accessible and and how how come this is happening particularly when it's something that has you know lasted over so many years so yeah I think to answer your question yeah I, I just don't think they are alone I don't I don't think they're the only ones and I also just think that you know it's is this is business to them it's kind of like these a big multi-billion dollar companies and they don't get to be multi-billion dollar companies by you know not doing you know not selling lots of shoes and and not really and I, and I think when you do that perhaps your moral compass will get a bit you know a bit wayward a little bit because it's kind of like you're you're always worried about the bottom line and you kind of you know what a, a few maybe they look at these the these incidents also as so infrequent that it, it's not worth their time perhaps you know I, I I don't work there so I don't you know I never got the opportunity to talk to them but it's only my my guess that you know they probably don't see it as that big of an issue so what's the point in giving it airtime and then making it a bigger issue but I think having spoken to sort of like a few of the pet of a, a few parents who have sort of like lost children to this all they ever wanted was acknowledgement you know, just want, they want the brand to sort of like condone and basically condemn this and, and just to be, you know, forthright and, and say, you know, that this happens and, you know, it shouldn't happen. And I don't think they've really ever done that in, in a way that has satisfied some of these uh, poor parents who have lost children to, you know, these senseless crimes. Absolutely. And I think that's what's hitting with this. I think that's why having that at the end of the documentary was to me what made this stand out from other things I've seen in that culture was you had the hard hitting realities of it. And certainly when, when the mother says in the interview that my son's not the first and I really hope he's the last. Mm -hmm. And that's that's what's powerful because it has that sense of dread. And then you know that he never was the last. It's going to continue. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. So yeah, that, that's kind of everything I've got to say for this because I'm out of time. Oh. Um, oh, nice one. Thank you, George. Thanks for your the, questions. No worries. I want to thank you for coming on. It was really good to talk. I said, I love the documentary. Oh, it thank really you so much. Into it. So, it's anyone really watching, kind of you. Home, it's absolutely fine. Anyone watching at home, do check this out on the BFI player when it just launched. I hope you enjoyed that interview. It was really good fun. It was great to have you on the show. Uh, it could have even gone on for longer. That's that's how much fun. I had a couple of questions I couldn't ask. So um, I had a really good time with this. And again, this is a part of the London Film Festival stuff. So I'm going to do the usual stuff. Uh, we don't know what videos we're going to do. We've got so many different films we're watching, different timings of us being free. So the best way to find out what content we're going to drop is on social media. So that's Facebook, Cinema Savvy, and at Twitter, at Cinema underscore Savvy. And of course, you guys that do like the t-shirts, we've got a link in the description below. Um, so that has been my interview today. It's been really good fun. Uh, such a good time watching it. It's a great documentary. I do recommend it. If you do want to watch the documentary when it does come out, that is going to be on the BFI player. Uh, it varies between 16 and 25. You can even get discounted tickets as well. So that's going to be premiering across the London Film Festival the next couple of days. But as usual, once again, thank you all for watching. Take care and see you at the next one.